Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. Now, regular listeners to Cleaning Up will know that I am a fan of nuclear, but with some caveats. So I'm very much in favour of life extension for existing nuclear plants where that can be done safely. I'm sceptical about the economics of gigawatt-scale nuclear plants, the really big plants like the ones built around the world to date. But I'm really intrigued by the promise of the next generation of fission reactors called SMRs, or small modular reactors. These are reactors which are built, as the name suggests, in smaller size, and many of which the designs are also walk-away safe. My guest today is Tom Sampson, and he is the CEO of Rolls-Royce SMR, one of the most promising and advanced of the new breed of SMR companies around the world. Please welcome Tom Sampson to Cleaning Up. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining us here today on Cleaning Up. It's a pleasure, Michael. Great to see you again. So what we always do is started by you describing what you do in your own words, because I'm just going to get it wrong and mangle things. So tell me exactly what you do. Well, I'm the chief executive officer of Rolls-Royce SMR Limited, which is a, a company that's been set up by Rolls-Royce. And it's now, uh, as well as Rolls-Royce, it's got three other shareholders. So I, I run that business for those shareholders. And I lead a team that is now about 600 plus people uh, across uh, across the UK that is now designing uh, the technology that's going through the application process in the UK uh, to bring our new Rolls-Royce factory built SMR to market. Right. Now, our audience, um, they're, they're all smart. You can assume they all know about climate change and most of them know a lot about energy, um, but they they are not nuclear they've also been listening to episodes on hydrogen where smr stands for something completely different so right. let's actually make sure we don't lose anybody with the acronyms you know i'm gonna i'm gonna bring you up short when you use acronyms i'm afraid so no smr problem. in the nuclear context means what small modular reactor and, and in the context of nuclear smr is quite a broad church you know, there's there's everything from a few megawatts and we are probably the largest uh, uh, SMR in the market. We're getting you know, over 470 megawatts electric uh, power from our from our unit. So we're at the high end of the scale. But it covers a whole range of uh, technologies that are defined as SMR because they are you know, significantly smaller than the gigawatt programs have been. But it does include a, a range of different fuel types, different megawatt capacities and different delivery modes. So the, we had Julia Pike on the show, and she was talking about mainly about the gigawatt scale. So those are the big pressurized water reactors, kind of nuclear as it currently exists on the electricity system. So when you talk about uh, 470 megawatts electric, um, that is just under half the size of a of a big nuclear power station as we know it. Actually, it's more like, no, a, th a third the size or a quarter the size of the units that are being built at Hinkley. Hinkley units are right. 1,600 megawatts, so they're, they're a large gigawatt. AB1000 uh, units from Westinghouse are about 1,200 megawatts, so we're, we're, we're a fraction of the scale of the current gigawatt fleet of reactors, which tend to be between 1,200 and 1,600 megawatts. So ours is is is, is the you know, small by comparison, but relatively large compared to the wider, broader church of uh, other SMR technologies. How small does the SMR category go down to? Because there are some very small nuclear uh, reactors that are being discussed, but those at some point there's a division between SMRs and micro reactors, correct? Yeah, you get down, you start getting down to, you know, deployable in a truck or deployable in a, a more mobile environment. I think they would be categorized as micro micro reactors in the kind of one to two uh, megawatt scale, but then everything in between that and, and where we are is probably a broad church of SMR uh, reactors that tend to be more 
more land based than probably that. Maybe that's a distinction in the adoption of the micro reactors are more agile and mobile than say uh, an SMRs, which tend to be grounded and, and fixed location. Because Rolls Royce also has a design, does it not, for something that's around the five megawatts mark that might go on board ships or to be used in very agile, potentially military situations. Is that right? Yeah, well, um, my colleagues in our defense business have been making a, a, a kind of much smaller reactor for space applications that could also, in defense applications, that could also have a, a crossover to commercial applications. And that is in that, that much, much, much smaller range of five megawatt uh, capacity. The background here is to create something then, for the, let's call it the SMR. It is not those very small, not, not space, not military, not shipping. It is for land-based. Um, and it is usually SMRs are proposed for electrical, uh, to produce electricity. There's a few proposals to use them for heat, district heating in, in uh, China, I believe. But you're really talking about electrical output mainly, correct? Well, actually, I think it does go broader than that, Michael. I think we absolutely are looking at on-grid applications where you plug the SMR into the grid and you make traditional electricity. Um, but I think there is a broader opportunity set at looking at off-grid applications where um, SMRs can be used to be dedicated to powering the data centers for hydrogen production, uh, for other energy-intensive usage uh applications as well so i think that that is a broad uh categorization that should consider smrs as addressing both traditional grid power but there are a growing number of off-grid applications that are very exciting as well okay, but but even those off-grid you just mentioned two which we'll come back to data centers and hydrogen those would both be um primarily electrical output that you'd be using um Primarily, although we've been doing a number of uh, studies on, on hydrogen production at that scale, which would include combination of uh, heat, thermal heat, as well as electricity to get higher performance uh, hydrogen production from, say, a solid oxide electrolyzer. So it doesn't have to just be electricity. We can combine it with heat. Uh, and generally as well, there is opportunities for us to use the, the back-end heat for district heating applications as well, which is not something we've done extensively in the UK, for example, but in many of the central European applications, that is a huge driving force for the energy transition is what solutions can be readily adapted to provide both electricity, but also district heating solutions. We talked about this in uh, the episode, the first episode we did on nuclear, which was with Kirsty Gogan yeah. uh, very early on in cleaning up history. Uh, we talked about how some people would think, wait a minute, uh, district heating with nuclear, you know, what could possibly go wrong having steam from a nuclear power station going into your home? But of course, it's all it's all completely it's a secondary uh, loop, fluid loop. It, it, this is not radioactive steam in any way, shape, or form, and never could be, right? Correct, correct. I mean, this we yeah. further further down the uh, uh, the steam extraction chain, and indeed the the district heating schemes would be entirely independent and isolated uh, networks that would sit outside of the nuclear power plant. And just transfer so it there's, through and do an exchange it. So there's all these different designs of small modular reactors, SMRs, and there's been this real kind of pre-Cambrian explosion of different types of designs, different types of fuels. Um, there's something like 50 or 60 different designs a few years ago when I last kind of, you know, looked in detail. What are the main design choices because i want to get on to your particular design but i just want to give our audience some sense of the range because they've got different trade-offs on all sorts of different dimensions so what are the different groups of smrs uh that that you see out there and then we'll come on to why have you chosen the design that you are pursuing you're pursuing at rolls royce right i think i think you can probably put it into two categories. There's some Gen 3 plus, let's call it, which is the kind of evolution of existing technologies. Um, and we would probably put ourselves in that category. Uh, and then I think you can call the Gen 4 technologies, which are more innovative nuclear reactions, more innovative nuclear fuels that, that either don't exist today or haven't been being commercially exploited at scale. And so 
I would look at the the SMR landscape in those two categories, and we are very much in the existing proven technology end of the spectrum, where we've actually genuinely, by design and by intention, not chosen to create a different type of nuclear reactor or nuclear fuel. We're using a pressurized water or light water reactor technology with standard standard enriched uranium for the reasons that allows us to bring a solution to market much more quickly. And are all the Gen 3, are they all pressurized water or are there some Gen 3 that take other uh, con conventional or existing technologies forward? Yeah, yeah not, not to spend too long talking about my competitor technologies, Michael, but uh, if you for oh, forgive me for that, but look, GE Hitachi have got a, a, a bond and water reactor design, so that's a different a existing technology, but a different type of reactor to a pressurized water reactor. Uh, New Scale has a a pressurized water reactor, but they've integrated it with a number of other components, such as the steam generator into an integrated reactor design. So they have a slightly different technology and, and risk profile. But I think GE Hitachi and, and New Scale are, are using existing Gen 3 Plus technologies. I think the, the newer design that EDF are exploring, I think, is a traditional uh, uh, PW pressurized water reactor with standard fuel. So I think those are the more near term deployable SMR solutions. And then you have other companies that are developing solutions that are using more innovative fuels like X Energy, uh, Terra Power, and so they're more into the Gen 4 categories. So those would be um, molten salt, um, uh, and then you've got the you've got uh, the traveling wave reactors, uh, Terra Power, very innovative, uh, but presumably the more innovative you are, the harder it is to get through the whole. Uh, the whole process of certification. Yeah, the process of certification is 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 make much more uh, risky and complicated, and will take longer. But more importantly, many of these other uh, designs will require a new form of architecture and infrastructure in country in terms of fuel, fuel handling, fuel disposal, management of fuel, management of waste, management of the of the various uh, aspects that are needed to to accommodate. Uh, technologies that don't exist today and that's that's one of the reasons why we've chosen to work with standard uh, enriched uranium standard pressurized water reactor because it's very well known it's already existing within the architectures that exist today and therefore it's much more easy for customers to adopt that solution without having to put in place all the investments to be able to accommodate a new design and a new type of fuel so what hopefully emerging then for the audience is understanding of where you've chosen to play, which is about a third of the size of these very big plants. Um, so it's a 470 megawatts versus more than a gigawatt. And it's using, uh, at least on the surface, conventional technology. So it's pressurized water, it's conventional fuel, and you're taking advantage of all the supply chains, presumably for components as well as for fuel. So if, if I were to correct characterization of where we've got to so far, then my question is, why does this transform the economics? Because surely you make things cheap by making them big in nuclear. You've gone the other way. So you're going conventional, but small. Why is that? Why is that a better solution economically? Well, I think what we're uh, demonstrating is you make things a lower cost uh, by building them on a much smaller scale. But what we've done is not just made a small stick build, build it in a field, small reactor. We've actually you know, extensively used modularization to transform how a nuclear power plant can be built. Um, and so we build it in a factory, not in a field. And that's a big differentiator between what we're, what we're bringing to market with our Rolls-Royce SMR is we're using not only our nuclear capabilities, which we've got in Rolls-Royce from our submarine and, and, and uh, uh, defense business, which we've had for like six decades, we're combining it with our production manufacturing expertise and how we can make highly complex, uh, heavily engineered products in a factory environment so that you're creating a pr product, not a project. And so that kind of productionization, commercialization, commoditization of a product is what allows us then to, to drive down the costs. Uh, improve on the schedule uh, and allow for the, the the inbuilt learning curve to flow from unit to unit uh, within a factory environment. Uh, and that's really the, the major transformational aspects that help us both 
reduce the schedule and by reducing schedule you you better manage cost and by using proven technology and in fact effectively commercially off the shelf products such as our turbine generator island which is no oh, commercially available product we can buy from many many companies in the world today we lower the innovative risk that we're introducing by bringing nuclear technology forward and we proudly proclaim not to have the world's biggest or the world's first uh in in, in anything that we're bringing into the market and for the audience that are not familiar we should probably just kind of do a quick recap of what rolls royce does and also importantly what it doesn't do this is not if anybody out there is listening and hoping that we're going to be talking about those lovely cars it's not that rolls royce that I, has, I think it's part of bmw if i'm not wrong um but but this what what is it what are the, where which businesses are you going to draw on to bring that manufacturing um te technology and know-how out of so rolls royce today operates in five business sections we have our civil aerospace business and we we deliver a large portion of the wide-bodied uh, uh, aircraft engine market uh, as Rolls Royce, and you'll see many of the Rolls Royce logos on the sides of uh, large uh, wide-body airplanes if you fly long haul. Uh, we have a defence business, both in the US and in the UK and, and Europe, that provides defence products, including the reactor technology for our submarine fleet here in the UK, which is where our nuclear heritage originates from within Rolls Royce. Uh, we also have in in Friedrichshafen in Germany, a power systems business that makes uh, uh, diesel generator sets that power a variety of applications, including land-based and marine applications. And then we have two new businesses that are focused on the energy transition, uh, electric flight, uh, and we have an electrical business that is providing electric propulsion systems, and we've actually flown the world's fastest electric aircraft in 2021. Uh, and then on top of that, we now have Rolls-Royce SMR, which is a uh, a separate company, but still majority owned by Rolls Royce PLC. Um, uh, but we also know we, we're part of that Rolls Royce family. Uh, you're absolutely correct. The Rolls Royce motor car has the license to the brand, uh, which is hugely powerful. But they, they, those cars are made uh, by by another company and under a separate separate business. and nothing to do with Rolls Royce PLC any longer, apart from the brand. Right. So the aerospace and the other energy businesses that gives you the heritage to be able to. Uh, manage a supply chain of components, but also ultimately, presumably, to manage service once you've got some of these out there with customers. Yeah, I mean, our contracting model will be quite different than, than the ones we use in those other businesses. And we're looking to deliver uh, a turnkey nuclear power plant. That's what we're bringing to the market, which I think is quite a big differentiator. We're doing all the integration. We're providing a single contract to our customers that will then allow us then to build them a fully integrated nuclear power plant that we'll then hand over um, and they would then operate that you know, over the life of that asset, which would be at least 60 years. So uh, that's the model that we, we've developed. But you're absolutely right. The manufacturing capabilities, the production line dynamics, the uh, the uh, nuclear uh, engineering, manufacturing and materials experience has all been built into the IP as we've created Rolls-Royce SMR that gives us the ability to take this technology forward. And indeed, we're in the midst of that regulatory approval process right now with the UK regulators to take this design forward for that UK certification. So I want to push on this question of modularity because it's really at the heart of why you think this is going to work and it's going to get, you know, sufficiently cheap to be economically viable. Where right. you know, I, I certainly have referred to the gigawatt scale plants as having been tested to economic destruction. I mean, I may be being ever so slightly unfair, but I'm not sure. Um, but the, the the modularity is really the secret source here. But as I've understood modularity for SMRs, I always thought that it was kind of, you had multiple of them to get up to gigawatt scale. But your version of modularity is that you want to make what's really quite a big nuclear power station 470 megawatts i mean it's not really small at all it's mid-sized i would call it but you want to make it in modules so that's what your version of modularity means correct yes i mean you, you refer to then something that's very similar to the new scale model where they have 50 60 70 megawatt units that are all lined up to get to a gigawatt or whatever many megawatts you want to get by by putting multiple small reactors. 200 like, or 150. I mean, these are more yeah. megawatts. These are the normal sizes that get, you know, described as SMRs. Right. 
So what we've done, and the reason why we've reached this capacity is we've actually tried to drive as much product into the factory as possible to enable us then to, to maximize that modularization benefit and to enable us to utilize the factory environment to do as much of the work as possible. And indeed, what that's constrained by is road transportability. So you can do the work in the factory and then you can transport the modules or the biggest components then directly to site to be assembled. So you're reducing the need to stick build, if, as they call it in the industry, which basically means connecting everything together in a site because it's too big to transport to the site. By making something that's big enough to take advantage of road transportation limits, you can maximize the activity in the factory, transport everything as you can to the site, and then the site focuses then on assembly of modular uh, products that have been maximized in terms of the production in the factory space. So that's what we've brought to market is that heavily modularized solution where we try to minimize the need to do work on, a, on site in a field in the open air by maximizing what can be built into modules that are then delivered to site for final assembly and products, the biggest single vessels that we have, which are then defined by road transportation limits. That's how we actually arrive at our 470 megawatts, Michael. That's the biggest reactor diameter we can transport by road. Uh, and therefore, that's as much fuel as we can get in to transport it by road is determined by that length. And that fuel in that pressurized water reactor creates about 1350 megawatts of thermal energy that converts into about 470 megawatts of electrical. So it's really bounded by road transportability constraints and maximizing then the work that's performed inside a factory. So you're going to have a lot of containers, if I understood it right, a lot of containers. But then each of them can go on a on the back of a truck. Each of them delivered by road, and then they get assembled. How many containers are we talking about? So we're still in the design stage of the numbers of modules that will be produced in our module factories. Uh, but it's going to be in the range of fifteen hundred to two thousand modules, and that that includes everything from modular structures that host stairwells and supporting structures. We're trying to drive modularization to create supporting structures for the actual building. So the building is actually the structures themselves. Um, and so that's roughly the range, depending on the actual detailed design of, of how many modules we'll need to be delivered for a single unit. So in your reactor vessel, which is the kind of one of the most critical parts, that's going to be made all off-site, put on the back of a truck, and it arrives, right? And that that's very different from the giga what scale where there's lots of welding that has to go on on site correct correct and, and the same for other components as well and the same for other components yeah what about the actual the, the containment i mean there's still an enormous amount of construction to make the site ready uh the the the, the concrete the the base plates the services and then the really important pressure the containment structures they still have to be built on site do they not so we, we, we're we maximizing how those aspects of the design are modularized as well. So we're working, for example, in a lot of work with Lang O'Rourke, who's our civil partner. They have a civil module factory in the UK already where they pre, pre-manufacture civil modules. So we adopt those into our design. Um, so we minimize the need for, for concrete pouring on site by exploiting those civil module solutions. Uh, but the containment, for example, is a steel containment that will be produced on site in a number of steel plates that will be then welded together and delivered to site as modules. So that's how we overcome the, the containment piece. Um, but every part of our design, we look at it to determine can modularization improve cost and schedule uh, and performance by being adopted. And that's, that's how we've looked at maximizing modularization on that basis across the plant. 2000 containers gets assembled on site if we have any children listening, I've got the perfect description of what you're doing. It's a Lego nuclear reactor. It's not I mean, it's small, a great analogy. modular because of that. It's it's modular because you, you're you going to build it from pieces on site. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there was an article okay. this weekend's Financial Times that talked about modular construction build and used the Lego analogy in terms of what could be possible with with small modular reactors as well. So that's a great analogy, Michael. That's exactly what this is. It's a, a Lego kit of parts that comes to the site and is connected and assembled uh, on the site. Darn it, there's me thinking I was really original and the FT has got there first. But it's, uh, 
I got I got to publication first, which I'm recording today. Not the, anyway, absolutely. Uh, but that that's a really good description. But now, what it leaves, of course, is the really difficult questions about how much cheaper will this be than the gigawatt scale power stations? Because you know they are. I've called it tested to economic destruction. Uh, we've got Hinkley, which cost in today's money, it's about 120 pounds per megawatt hour, 140, 150 dollars per megawatt hour. The resulting electricity. We got Sizewell. We're supposed to believe is going to be, you know, so much cheaper. And we had Julia Pike on the show. Um, I challenged her. Uh, she wouldn't answer. She couldn't answer because she's negotiating. But you know, I'm thinking 80 to 90 pounds maybe $100, $110 per megawatt hour is probably believable. What are you? What price point are you going to deliver power at? Well, I think, and I'll try and, I'll try and give you as complete an answer as I can, Michael, given, given that we're also open to move into negotiations on a number of fronts in terms of delivery of these units. But what I would say is, um, and, and Julia mentioned this in her, her, her podcast as well, is that cost of capital does play an important part. So, for example, whether we could access a regulated asset-based model uh, using the nuclear financing bill for SMRs would affect the cost of capital. If we didn't access that, we had to use a CFD, and we were then looking at a weighted average cost of capital of, say, 90%, then the numbers would be high. So we, need to, we need to explain CFD. So, so that's CFD a, would be a contract for difference where the only way that not just not you, but your customer gets remunerated is by selling electricity or other services. But you'd have to finance the whole build period without any revenues. Uh, right. Unlike the regulated asset-based model where you get some payments throughout during the construction period. So just for those listeners who are not you know, completely right. okay with all of the acronyms. And there's two benefits to the regulated asset-based model. As, as you say, you can achieve a return on your equity and your debt during the build phase, which well, for gigawatts even longer, but it's still a number of years for SMR. So that reduces the need to fund interest during construction. But also, depending on the structure of the regulated asset base, there's a role to be played for us as a contractor to take risk. There's a role to be played for equity to take risk. And there's a role to be played for the customer to share some risk. And so depending on how that risk allocation is structured and depending on how much government support there is behind that regulated asset-based model, the costs of capital in a regulated asset-based model could be significantly lower than a contract for differences model, which would traditionally rely upon you no know, project finance type debt and equity. Okay, so look, at the range though. If you say, right, you get a really good regulated asset-based model at one end, and you have to go for a pure contract for different CFD base at the other end. What is the range of power price that you're going to be able to deliver? So I think in the in the uh, regulated asset base space, we're going to be between 40 and 50 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. And I think in the contract for differences space, we're probably going to be between 60 and 70, probably around 70 for the first units. And as we get down that learner curve, subsequent units then uh, coming in around the 60 or below mark as we come down in that cost curve um and so that's that's the benefit of the learning curve being applied unit to unit as we build out a fleet of these things for a global deployment that will allow us then to drive down the costs would that be for your first unit yeah so the range covers you no know, somewhere the first units will be at the upper end of that range and then second third and fourth units would start to come down and we would then drive towards you know, the bottom end of that range or even lower once we got through uh end of a kind deployment and we started to deploy more units there is other differences as well michael that's worth highlighting such as if we're building these things in other jurisdictions and other countries then costs of labor wherever the factories are located could have an influence so there's a number of factors but that that gives you the sense that that importantly is the premise on which this technology is being developed it's being developed as a low-cost solution and we've now got the underpinning and the evidence to back up those costs that give us the confidence to enter into contracts, uh, hopefully in the near term, to deliver these units on the market. Very interested to know if you can share, what is that evidence? Because the question is, why should anyone believe you when nuclear has got just such a, a desperately poor, frankly, um, track record? There's a, a tremendous academic at Oxford called Ben Flivberg, and he's just uh, publishing a book. He's, he's done so before. Um, and he looks at different 
project and how much their cost overruns are typically. And nuclear, the number is 120%. I mean, the only thing worse for cost control than nuclear, frankly, is uh, the Olympics, where each Olympic city says, oh, it's going to be cheap and marvelous, and it ends up being expensive and marvelous. Um, why should anybody believe your your numbers? Well, I think if we were proposing to build you no know, the same type of solutions that were the basis for that evidence, then that would be, be a fair challenge, Michael. But the design that we've developed, the purpose behind our design is to come up with a much lower cost and more deliverable with greater certainty solution. And that's why the factory build concept, that's why our modularization concept, that's why sizing this to maximize the use of commercially available product that's in the market helps us to then not only deliver a lower cost solution with greater certainty, but build up that evidence base uh, as we go forward to provide that certainty. And I, I don't uh, underplay the complexity and the risks involved in doing this, and there needs to be appropriate contingencies made. But again, these are much more digestible units, uh, knowing the kind of two to two and a half billion pound range for these first units. That's a different proposition than taking that kind of risk on a 25 plus billion pound uh, program. So our ability to demonstrate control and manage risk on a much smaller scale is what gives us the ability to have that have that confidence. And I can I can tell you we've been scrutinized by the UK government as we've gone through and secured our grant. We've been scrutinized by the investors who put equity into this business in November 2021 alongside uh, Rolls Royce. We've been scrutinized as we access the UKRI grant funding. Uh, we'll be scrutinized again by our shareholders before we sign these contracts. But we have got our uh, evidence base and we're working with the supply chain. We're working with partners to solidify and approve that evidence base over the coming months. But, you know, the scrutiny is great, but of course, you know, Hinckley was scrutinized, Vocal in the US was scrutinized, Flamonville was scrutinized, Olkiluoto was scrutinized, Taishan was scrutinized, and manufacturing things in factories is no guarantee against cost overruns, setting up a new factory. And, you know, even, uh, um, you know, a good friend, um, Elon Musk setting up his factories, you know, it was very lucky that he had access to infinite free capital at the time because he was always enormously late and enormously over cost as well. Uh, I think the the challenges are real and, and that's why the analysis, the engineering, the confidence has to be you know, demonstrated with contracts, with supply chain evidence, with parties who are prepared to share the risk with us in delivering these products. So all those things are things that we're doing today to enable us to bring this program to market. We, we're we actually taking responsibility for an integrated design. That isn't something that has happened uh, in all gigawatt programs or isn't happening in all SMR programs. So taking accountability and responsibility for that integrated approach, managing the interfaces, being the design authority and controlling the design decisions across the whole plant, specifying the numbering system, specifying the kit of parts that will be used inside the modules. These are all elements that will massively de-risk delivery and provide greater price certainty to enable us to, to move forward. Now, again, not without risk, not without execution risk, not without supply chain risk, but we have to then make sure we have the strength of those underpinnings and the evidence to give us the confidence to come forward and enter into these contracts. So Tom, you've given a range of electricity costs between 40 and 70 pounds per megawatt hour, depending to a certain extent on how it's uh, funded and regulated. But if I was to say right now, I will buy one of these, but you, I want you Rolls-Royce SMR to take the risk of any cost overruns that push the price above 70 pounds per megawatt hour. So you take that risk. I'll put the money down. I'm good for it but I want you to take the risk of any overrun above 70. Would you sign that contract today? Uh, I think we would, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we're in this business. That's what our job is, is to deliver uh, that cost certainty uh, and deliver those projects. Now, we wouldn't necessarily do that project for a fixed price lump sum no, number. We may have a fixed target. We may have a, a target element. We may have contingency. And we try and do that as clearly and as transparently as possible. Uh, all of which would, would build up to, to those numbers that I referred to. So 
I don't think we would be uncomfortable with, with taking that risk on board. We've just got to convince our shareholders to, to, of that strategy, and we've got to demonstrate to them the confidence, as I mentioned, that underpins that. But one thing I would say to you, Michael, is there aren't any other contractors that we're aware of in the SMR world that are offering that turnkey solution. So, no, regardless of how much uh, risk is, is, is being taken, and I've said to you we would take risk. Now, what that risk looks like in the detail is obviously a matter for negotiation, but we're bringing to market an integrated solution and a turnkey solution to deliver a fully integrated nuclear power plant. That's a big differentiator in this space. And that in itself is a demonstration of our commitment to taking on that risk. Yeah, I think the question is not about the turnkey solution so much as um, uh, as the risk of the cost not being 70, but being 80, being 90, um, the start date being so late, that which drives up the cost of electricity as well, those sorts of things. And would you, do you have sufficient uh, balance sheet to stand behind that? Because... I mean, I'm not aware that you do, by the way. Well, Rolls-Royce SMR doesn't, so we're going to have to manage that in conjunction with our with our shareholders and with the with the the first customers to try and make sure we define something that's going to work for all parties. And that I don't want to disclose or get into the nitty gritty details of what that might look like, Michael. But I can tell you, we wouldn't be coming to the table offering an integrated turnkey solution unless we were prepared to have that uh, open and transparent conversation of how that risk is allocated otherwise we're, we're not a distinct uh, and different solution yep. in the marketplace let's talk a little bit about the role of these um smrs the, S, the rolls royce smrs so the 470 megawatt smr let's talk about the role of that in the energy system because you know even at 40 50 60 70 pounds per megawatt hour um that is higher than the cost of other sources of clean electricity, which are perhaps less problematic from the perspective of um, fuel, uh, proliferation, uh, waste management. It, there's just fewer headaches with some of the other solutions which produce electricity more cheaply. So why would anybody use your solution? I think, and I'll talk in general terms about nuclear, because I think that's the, the challenge that you're asking, and I think it has to be a low cost deliverable nuclear solution to be in that marketplace. But what nuclear offers is quite different. The quality of nuclear power is quite uh, unique in the clean energy space. Now you talk about other alternative sources of energy, they're not often compared on a like for like basis with what is equi equivalent firm power that's providing available, dependable, uh, always on clean power 24 seven. That, that in itself is a valuable uh, element to any balanced energy mix and so the, in fact, the greater the dependency on intermittent renewables, the greater the reliance there will be on having a form of clean, dependable, uh, available uh, power. So I, th I think that there has to be that factor built into it. I think renewable marginal costs of additional turbines on additional wind farms or uh, those costs have come down dramatically over the last 15 years, and rightly so, to prove the, uh, the value of that type of solution. We expect nuclear costs when we start to roll out fleets of SMRs to come down as well in price as we build up that supply chain and we transfer that knowledge and experience in, in the factory environment. So I think that we have to make sure we're comparing apples with apples. We, we have to do, Tom, we have to do one other thing. I agree with that, but we have to also do one other thing, which is um, the nuclear has to play nicely with the renewables, right? Because when you talk about dispatchable and base, uh, you know, ba the people use the word baseload and so on. The problem with that is that the very cheap renewables, um, they outcompete nuclear when it's windy, when it's sunny, and the nuclear gets kind of shifted to have to load follow. And as soon as it does that, your capacity factor falls and your costs go up. Um, so that uh, because the, the, the 70 pounds, if it's that, is on the basis of it working 365. 24 hours a day or as near as possible. So 90, 95% of that. So how do you integrate what you're doing into a grid, which we all know is going to be dominated by frankly cheaper, but variable renewables. So I agree. It's a great point, Michael. And it's a perennial debate we have within our industry in terms of the energy transition is how do you get the balance right? And I think that's, that is the key, key debate and the key topic. 
Uh, I think that what I would say is on the on the uh, the, the, the comparison and, uh, and getting the balance right, we, we've got to think of this number, and I, I use it a lot in my thinking, at 8,760. 8,760 is the number of hours in a year. And we've got to have generation available 8,760 hours a year. And that that's essential for customers, for stability. It's essential uh, to, to ensure that we've got a grid that we can rely upon. And I think that's, that's the first thing we have to think through. Um, nuclear power, though, will operate for 18 to 21 months between refueling outages at that level of availability, as you say, maybe 90, 95% with the fuel outages, which gives you no, eight, seven, sixty a year, and an outage year, I know, slightly less than that. But that is dependable power. I think we need to you know, recognize that as we have more and more renewables, the intermittency impacts make it more and more important that we've got a clean source of power that is available, eight, seven, sixty. And uh, well, scale of the challenge. I get, I'll come to your point about yeah. the about the balancing aspects in terms of interruptions and changes in demand profile and. Um, I, I don't subscribe to the base load is dead philosophy. I think there will always be an element of base load. You may say it will be higher or lower than it's been historically, but I think there will always be a, a chunk of power that has to be met 8,760 hours of the year. But to your point about balance, n nuclear can be used, as I say, for a range of other mechanisms. And whilst there might be times when the grid would like the nuclear asset to fluctuate, you could choose to fluctuate the power in an SMR, it may not be the most cost-effective thing to do, and a more cost-effective way to do with that interruption and in, in demand might be to divert that power to produce hydrogen, ammonia, synthetic fuels, or other products that can be then produced in a much more dispatchable way in conjunction with a, with an SMR. But I, I do think that, that we're kind of using the the wrong lens to look at that challenge because we are going to need base load. I mean, I think the UK... Think we're going to need base load, but the fact is we're not because we're going to have a huge amount of wind, which we, you know, because base load, let me, let me just be very clear, because base, base load, the word comes from the demand side. It says, well, there's some minimum level of demand always. And then it, then it switches to the supply side and said, and says, and therefore there are some large cheap plants that will run... 24 seven, never get switched off and are cheap. That's where it comes from. But the fact is there is, you know, the, the, there is no plant that is going to be expected to run 8760 hours a year, because what that would mean is switching off vast amounts of, in the UK's case, wind in other countries, solar for many, many hours a year. And unless they happen to coincide with a peak. Now, the fact is, that is proven low-cost electricity that we know, and at the margin, by the way, it's got zero marginal cost, no fuel at all, unlike yours. So you you are going to have to, you're going to be reckon, you're going to be squeezed down to a thousand hours, five hundred hours, unless you I don't, can find a better role in the energy system. I don't, I don't agree, Michael, with that with that analysis. Are you saying, Tom? Let me ask you this: Are you saying that unless you can sell all your electricity as close to eight, seven, sixty hours per year. You cannot be built. Is that what you're saying? Because I think that. Um, well, if you only generate power for no sixty percent of that time, then the cost of that power has to be increased accordingly to reflect the fact you're not using it a hundred percent of the time. Um, you're right. Renewable wind, uh, renewable energy can can operate for thirty percent of the time and still be economical at that point, fifty, sixty pounds a megawatt hour, because that's it's been used whenever it's been produced. And so that, that allows it to operate on an economical basis with only 30% or 40% or 50% uh, availability. Now, my question to you, Michael, is, is there a direct correlation between that demand and supply on a second-by-second -second basis today? There isn't. So do you have a full match between the demand for clean energy, which is 24-7, and the supply of clean energy, which is 24-7. That that doesn't happen right. today. So first of all, that, no, but let me answer that. No, of course it doesn't match. It needs to be matched. There are a number of ways of matching it, right? That's why, right. you know, the high you, that, what do you do to that, match it? So first of all, there's demand response, and we'll have a lot more that we should come back to that because in the context of hydrogen, ammonia, um, 
ceramic. Hydrogen and oxygen. ammonia require energy to produce, so you've already created a bigger problem in trying well, to generate. No, 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 I'm talking about matching. What do you use to match? So then right. what we'll be using is demand response, we'll be using interconnections, we'll be using overcapacity, uh, we'll be using you know, various forms of storage. But what we won't be doing, because here's the thing that I'm pushing on. If your logic is that there are times when there isn't wind and therefore we need nuclear, but therefore we're going to run it 365 days a year and therefore we don't need the wind, I can tell you you will not you will you will sell no power stations that way because the fact is we've got the wind already very successful and cheap and we're going to have a load more of it because it is you know currently being sold and built so then that michael that doesn't that doesn't address the fact look look let's take 2022 right solar and wind in the uk accounted for 78 terawatts hours of electricity production right and that's from an installed renewable base of say 30 gigawatts okay the total energy consumed electricity consumed in 2022 was about 256 terawatt hours so that's a 30 percent of the uk's energy not megawatts not capacity on windy days yep. but over the 12 months about 30 percent of our energy production came from those renewable sources which means that 70 percent of the energy came from gas coal biomass, nuclear, hydro, storage, interconnectors. Maybe okay? gas and nuclear. So how are you going to replace that 70%, even if you build more wind capacity, well, which is only available where for I, those... Where, where I'm going, going with this, where I'm going with this is, and by the way, you know, that um, 70 terawatt hours is going to increase enormously as we build out the existing, you know, the, the already committed offshore wind that we've committed, right? Um, and by the way, I won't go into things like X links, where I'm, you know, for disclosure, I'm an investor. But you know, X links really can idea. bring in renewable power, dispatchable, same stuff as you sell for forty eight pounds without all of the brain ache of nuclear, other brain, a different brain ache to do with security and so on, but but not the nuclear brain ache. But what we have, a, what there's a premium on, is the dispatchable, the flexible power that can fill in the times when there isn't any wind, right? But you're not offering that. So instead of offering a flexible solution, which you can offer, by the way, by pairing it with industrial sure. output. Yeah, we can offer that. You're trying to we offer an inflexible solution. No. And I think that's gonna, that, I think that's a problem. No, no, I think we, I've, I've explained that we do offer a flexible solution by how you can combine you know, multiple uh, SMRs to produce a combination of grid electricity, produce hydrogen, produce ammonia, produce synthetic fuels in a variety of forms. But you so need to can be determine... really flexible, not flexible in different uses, but flexible in the sense of when there's no wind, meet the need, but when there is wind, do something else. That's flexibility. That's what that's what the grid needs. That's Well, the grid still needs power to cover 8, 7, 60 hours of the year. And I'm not saying that's the only use that we provide, but it's definitely a role that nuclear can play in a balanced energy mix. And it's maybe not a convenient argument for a renewable perspective, but again, we're not against renewable. I think there should be as much renewable built in this country as possible, and hopefully that 30% will get up to 50%. But, it will never get to 100%, even in a country like the UK. Let me try this in the interest of resolving this one, because let me propose, I mean, how I see this working, because I do see the role, um, but I'm, we're not quite there yet in this conversation, if you've got to, So I see, I see that, nuclear's role, if it's going to have one, would be largely to power big industrial processes. So for instance, your electrolysis, your uh, metals processing, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, desalination if you're in an area that needs desalination and so on. And then the periods when the renewables, which are very cheap and lovely, but then they fall off the system, what happens is the electricity price on the grid soars, right? It goes up into hundreds and hundreds of dollars per megawatt hour. And at that point, what you want to be doing is shutting down those, or you and your customers, shutting down those industrial processes and selling all your electricity to the grid. And if it's linked with hydrogen, then what you use to get through those windless or sunless times is some 
hydrogen or a derivative out of storage and you serving the grid, which enormously reduces the storage requirement and therefore is you know potentially highly um, eco you know so highly economically uh, attractive on the systems basis. But it only works if your customers can shut down. Because if again, what you can do is run three sixty five, I think you I think you become part of the problem, not part of the solution. Well, I mean, I think we can see in those markets where nuclear is operating today a massive demand for that twenty four seven clean energy. People are ex extending lives of those nuclear assets. People are are uh, bringing nuclear assets back online uh, to, to access that twenty four seven clean energy. And, and and I think there's. There's a huge amount of opportunity of flexibility. The second point, the point like you so, you, but Tom, what we also see is nuclear power stations, particularly you know in the U.S., having to be subsidised because, quite frankly, it's cheaper now to add renewables and to shut your that's nuclear not entirely, some kind of set up mechanism. That's not entirely fair because most of those markets, it's the marginal cost of gas that is determining the market conditions that make it uneconomical for those nuclear plants to run. And it's the low cost availability of shale gas in the U.S. over the last decade that has made it harder for those nuclear assets to operate on a, on a competitive basis. So it's not fair to say it's purely a result of the large volumes of renewable energy in the U.S. that's created that problem for the nuclear assets over there. My only point, Michael, is this. What you seem to be suggesting is that many consumers of electricity need to change their consumption habits to reflect the large volumes of wind and solar energy that's going to come into the system. And I'm just challenging whether those consumers of energy are going to be prepared to do that or whether they are indeed going to seek a 24-7 source of energy they can rely upon that is clean on a, on, a, on a constant basis. It's a good point. I mean, look, we're going to see enormous changes in consumption anyway because we're going to see the electrification of transportation with a lot of storage. And we're going to see the electrification of heat with, by the way, a lot of thermal storage, which is also hopefully going to be highly, highly useful. And and we should be building in more district heating schemes. So I think the hypothesis that you build a nuclear asset that can operate 24-7 in this huge clean energy transition, but then ask it to shut down or no, come well, on. No, I don't, no Tom, just to be clear, what I think it should be doing is, frankly, you know, it should be serving all of the different bits um, that of primarily industry, because that's large-scale demand, that right. that can be subjected to demand response. So that so that it's not them that should, not the nuclear that shuts down, it's the industry that shuts down, right? And I think that, that, that is a harder, a harder change to implement because that changes the cost of their production, it changes the cost of their product. And so I think, I think that is a harder, and then, harder sale. And that... Many of them, look, many of them shut down anyway they shut down for maintenance. They do it when they want. What we're saying is there's a lot more capacity to be flexible around industry. And lots of industries that have got no idea, they've never even looked at what um, time shifting might entail. It just hasn't been important. Now it becomes highly valuable. But the other thing is long-term storage, storage, potentially via hydrogen, um, that is... You know, that, that is, uh, and you may know, I'm quite a skeptic on lots of use cases for hydrogen. That's one that I'm not skeptical about because I do think that that, is, that does allow larger volumes of time shifting in the system. And that paired with nuclear, particularly also because your heat could be very useful in the production of hydrogen. Sure. I see that as potentially highly, highly promising. No, I, I agree. I think the, the, the applications of, for nuclear to produce hydrogen to produce synthetic fuels to produce other forms of energy, energy intensive uh, applications in this energy transition are, are, are huge I think I, I really enjoyed your podcast with Francesco Staracci uh, he, he was he was grossly affronted by the prospect of using this very precious hydrogen molecule for for something as crude as generating uh, power in a gas turbine but the the hydrogen uh, production uh, opportunity is is there in terms of how is it going to be produced whether it's the colors of the rainbow discussion or actually how do you actually produce it cost competitively i think is going to generate where the real opportunities are because the demand is going to come for hydrogen and then both of us should probably defer to another cleaning up guest julio friedman who would right. say that what you're anyway going to be doing with it is using it for direct air capture of carbon i, mean, I personally think that that's going to be uh, excessively expensive and not really going to happen that much 
Um, similar to, by the way, uh, I think we might disagree on the costs of synthetic fuels, which I think are largely not going to be a thing. Um, but there's definitely going to be a need for a lot more clean electricity and a lot more clean heat. So somehow this I, will figure itself out. I, I agree. I think the electrification agenda over the next 20, 30 years is going to drive huge demand for clean energy. And I think that's the marketplace in which we expect our Rolls-Royce SMR to flourish. Tom, thank you so much for spending time uh, with us here today. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, lots of questions answered, some questions not answered, uh, but no doubt you and I will revisit them probably face to face uh, over the coming years. It's been a great pleasure. Always an ex excellent uh, and energetic debate, Michael. Fantastic questions. And thank you so much for spending so much time on your podcast for another nuclear debate. Really, really worthwhile. Thank you. So that was Tom Sampson, CEO of Rolls-Royce SMR. My guest next week is Dr. Nawal Al-Hassani, and she is the United Arab Emirates permanent representative to IRENA, that's the International Renewable Energy Agency. And with the UAE hosting COP28 later this year, it's bound to be an important and fascinating episode. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Dr. Nawal Al-Hassani. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation.